Can I Ma'am, we are live now. All right, all right. Madhav, you can go ahead. Right. Um, so, very good morning to everyone. Welcome to the first lecture of This is Lit, the JGLS Litigation Lecture Series 2022. My name is Madhav Shankar, and I'm an assistant professor at Jindal Global Law School at the OP Jindal Global University. It is an honor to welcome on behalf of JGLS our guest, guest speaker for today's session, Advocate Sanchita Ayn, a partner at ASV Legal and an advocate of record at the Supreme Court of India. Advocate Ayn will be sharing her insights today on how to be an advocate on record. With an experience of almost a decade in the field of law, she has handled complex matters before the Supreme Court and various high courts and other forums in the country. These include landmark constitutional cases, such as linking of Pan with Aadhaar, Triple Talaq, affirmative action, rights of minority institutions, land acquisition cases, the 2G spectrum case, and several other matters relating to civil corporate competition service and family laws. Advocate Ayn has been described as a people-oriented lawyer by her ex-boss, Mr. Salman Khushi. She holds the prestigious LLM degree in international human rights law with distinction from University of Essex and takes great pride in working in the area of gender and disability rights. She also advises various startups, early stage companies and has clients from the entertainment industry as well. It is indeed an absolute privilege to have you with us today. I now humbly invite advocate Sanchita Ayn to deliver the lecture. I will be taking up your questions from the comment section towards the end of the session. Over to you. Thank you so much, Madhav. Thank you so much for having me here today. Um, since I understand most of you uh, who are attending this lecture would be students, I have kind of tried to uh, design it in a way so that it benefits you more, right? Instead of going into details as to what the exams are and, and how to clear it, I, I thought I'll try to uh, you know, help you understand what you can do while you are a student. So if you are aiming to become an advocate on the world. I thought that would be really useful. I'll just, uh, can you just allow the screen sharing? I have a PPT, I'm sorry, I should have told you in advance. Um, can the screen sharing be enabled, Sajid? So, while it's being done, I hope many of you uh, may be wondering, uh, when is the right time? right? When is the right time to start to practice in Supreme Court, right? So by now you would have done a few internships or you haven't done internships and you uh, may not be very comfortable with the space. You may be at different spaces right now uh, when it comes to Supreme Court and you may not be sure if you can become an advocate in a court. I think that's also one of the issues you may be facing. When should you start Supreme Court practice should you start at the, right at the beginning. The people who have these concerns, I think we can address these concerns at the end. I'm raising it so that you keep it in your mind. Uh, it's never too early, never too late. That's short response that I would like to give at the moment. Um, it's still not enabled. Uh, if someone can ask Sajid to do it. Uh, okay. Yeah, I'm. I'm on it. I'll just. No problem. Uh, I'll continue. Uh, um, so the thing is, uh, in Supreme Court, can you start practicing when just after graduation? The answer is yes. There are so many lawyers who join a seniors chamber or an advocate on records chamber as a fresher. So it's it's nothing like you cannot do it. Are you allowed to argue? Uh, yes, you can. But as per the rules. If you have below one year of experience, then you can only mention matters, seek Passover, ask for adjournment. But if the court allows you, then you can still go ahead and argue the matter. That's what the rule says. So one year is what the rule says. Even that can be exempted by the court before whom you are trying to argue your matter, right? Drafting, there's no restriction. There are many lawyers who start, in fact, I started my practice working under an advocate of record. So there's no bar to it, right? Um, the other aspect is 
uh, what is the minimum eligibility criteria? Is there any? Can you sit for the exam right away? The answer is no. You need to have an experience of not less than four years, right? So it's not necessary to have that experience in the Supreme Court. It's not necessary to have that experience with an AOR or a senior advocate, none of that. You just need to be enrolled for four years, at least four years. Even if you have done six years, seven years, whatever, you can still write the exam, right? You can still become an AOR. Minimum four years on the date of commencement of the training. So once you have completed four years, then you wait for the notification. Uh, usually it's around April that they ask you to submit your commencement certificate, right? So then uh, your commencement certificate, for example, the training is commencing from 1st of April and you need to get a certificate from the AOR with minimum 10 years of experience and you need to submit that certificate, notifying that my training under an AOR has commenced after I have completed four years of practice, right? And then after one year, then you submit the completion certificate. Now, whether you have to work in that chamber exclusively during that training period, again, there's no hard and fast rule on that, but you need to submit the certificate is what the rules say, right? So uh, therefore, what uh, many people do is they have a sort of arrangement with the AOR, they attend a few proceedings, etc. For example, I had already worked under an AOR. So I wouldn't have specifically needed a one-year full-time training under an AOR, but still there was a requirement. And I did kind of ensure that I was also assisting him in matters, but that was more of a, you know, something that, that an arrangement that we both had, that we, I will attend the proceedings uh, uh, that he, uh, that I draft, et cetera, et cetera. So all these arrangements you can have with the AOR, you write the exam after four plus one year is what the, then the requirement is. Four plus one year of years of practice, right? So now it's... Right. So this is where we are. Right, but actually if you see, it becomes seven years. How? Because four years you need to complete on say 1st of April or 30th of April. Now, when do you generally enroll? You generally enroll in July. So then what happens is if you have enrolled, say in July, 2022, then your four years will be July, 2026. And you can only apply for commencement of training in April, 2027. And then you write the exam next year, right? And then the results come out after one year. So it becomes actually seven years. So that's the time frame you need to keep in mind where if you want to become an AOR, sometimes people are taken by surprise. I think most of them are taken by surprise that we just thought four plus one and we become one, that doesn't happen, right? So um, there are various ways uh, you can, as I was telling you, you can start to practice. It can be under, as a junior to an advocate record, it can be under a senior, it can be right after college, whether you should, what you should do, et cetera, et cetera. There are different kind of uh, uh, career trajectories that people follow, uh, but I personally feel starting to practice under a senior advocate as a fresher may not be very advisable. It may be very lucrative. Sometimes uh, senior advocates tend to pay you a lot, et cetera, but it may not be the best way to start your practice. You should perhaps start it from a drafting chamber where you learn your drafting, drafting skills and then you go to work under a senior advocate. That's the general practice, right? Um, and then you can also be a junior. It's not necessary to do, even if you want to do Supreme Court matters, there are other lawyers also who brief senior advocates who argue the matters by themselves. So it's not necessary that you have to become an I'll come to what is the advantage if you become an AOR, but there are other lawyers also. You, you look around and you see that there are other lawyers also and who, who may not be very good, for example, in arguing. And therefore what they do is they brief another lawyer. They may not even brief a senior advocate, they'll brief another lawyer, they'll ask the AOR to argue, but they're getting the matter. They're getting something out of it, or they're also drafting the matter and just asking the AOR to file and argue. 
sometimes they argue it by themselves. So whatever works for you, if you're good in drafting, then continue to draft, just get it filed through an advocate on board. So you can do all of this even before completing seven years of practice, right? Uh, and therefore it's important that you do your internship. So you don't keep it thinking that, you know, okay, fine, this is not the time when I can learn Supreme Court work. I have to do internships, mostly what, what people think is, oh, I have to do internships because I have to show it in my CV, but it's not necessary for me to understand what's going on in court because I'm too young to understand, but that's not, uh, I, I think that's the time when you can learn a lot when you're in internships. If you are really looking to get on record, then I'll, I'll tell you what all can you do uh, during internships and, and while you're studying and reading judgments, what all you need to keep in mind, right? Um, okay, so then these are the different ways in which even retired judges practice, other retired professional. I know somebody who retired uh, who was a prosecutor in CBI, who was a, you know, at a very senior post in CBI, all of these people have been practicing. So as I was saying, even if you're good at buffing, you still can have a practice in Supreme Court. You're good at briefing, you're good at arguing, and it's all unlike other courts where you need to do all of it by yourself. These things can be delegated, and it's still as rewarding as it would be otherwise if you're good at one and you delegate the other, right? Um, then comes why to become an advocate on record. As we saw that you can practice in Supreme Court in different ways. Then why do you need to become an advocate on record? Just for the sake of it? No, I don't think you should do anything for the sake of it. So um, advocate on record is somebody who gets to file and argue. So only an advocate on record is authorized to file before the Supreme Court. Other lawyers can argue, but it will be only after receiving instructions from advocate on court. So uh, in litigation practice, you use terms like instructions from the client, from an advocate on record. It, it just means what is to be done is to be told by the advocate on record to the other lawyer. Only then he can argue, right? Otherwise, and it's only an advocate on record who can file and argue with Filing, nobody else can do, only an advocate. Um, okay, why is it so? We'll come to that. Okay, Supreme Court, uh, again, recognizes three categories. So sometimes it will say advocates in record slash advocates and senior advocates. Sometimes it will say advocates in record, non-advocates in record, senior advocates, etc. So they can be different categories, but advocate in record is definitely one important category when it comes to Supreme Court. And how does that benefit you? is something that you may want to look at. So let's see how, uh, so I'll show you one circular. What is this circular? It's dated 26th November, 2021. And I hope you can see it. Uh, if not, please let me know. Uh, applications are invited from the desirous advocate on record for supplementing the existing SCLSC Education Record Panel. Now, this is an important panel. It is Supreme Court Legal Services Committee panel, right? Those who, who provide legal services. Um, there are many lawyers who are on the panel who then become senior advocates, etc., because that's one of the um, several criteria they look into. Um, so two years of experience as an advocate on, on record is what they're seeking, right? Minimum two years of experience. Um, whereas when you look at non-advocate on record category, same panel, it's saying seven years experience and power. So these can be the differences uh, you may come across uh, if you are not an advocate on record, right? Uh, and then if you also look at, uh, uh, I was- uh, uh, Interrupt yes, now. Uh, the circular is not visible on the screen. Ha, so but I have to stop sharing and reshare. That's how- right. Right. Yeah, 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 that's no problem. Right. Now is it visible? Yes, ma'am, now it's visible. Okay, perfect. Thank you. So um, I was showing you this, these two circulars. This is for advocate on record, two years experience of advocate on record, whereas when it comes to non-advocate on record, seven years experience at bar. 
you may definitely say that when you become an advocate on a court, you already have seven years of experience, etc. And therefore, it may not make such a huge difference. But uh, the thing is, you may see that there are two separate categories here, and that those those will always remain, right? There may be something that's exclusive for advocates on record as well, right? Uh, then comes your uh, I was looking at the list of judges and I was looking at uh, people who had been first advocates, advocate on record and then designated as senior advocate and then they were elevated, right? So I'll just show you the list of AORs and you will see that these are the lawyers who have been designated as senior advocates and then out of which you will find there are many who have been, uh, at least a few who have been elevated as Supreme Court judges as well, right? So these are the various prospects that open for you if you become an advocate on record. Otherwise also it's, it's available. I just want you to know that it's, it's not like the doors close if you are not an advocate on record, but this is what people look for that's why they become an advocate. I know many counsels who chose not to become an advocate on record because they wanted to be arguing counsels, they wanted to be briefed, and therefore they chose. Even as advocates on record, for example, uh, Justice Yu Yu Lalit, he used to get a lot of cases to even argue, not just to fight. So it's not like if you become an advocate on record, you just become a filing counsel. You can still argue. You may still be briefed if you prove yourself to be a good arguing counsel. You will be briefed by other lawyers, even other AORs, in matters, and that's how your your chances of being designated becomes higher. Okay. Okay. Then comes. Uh, so when I read the topic, how to be an advocate and record, I was thinking, uh, what does it take to be an advocate and record? So becoming an advocate and record for me entails more than just clearing the exam. Mostly you will look at sessions where they do how to become an advocate. They're just confined to just create, clear the exam, you become an advocate record. For me, becoming is way more than just, just clearing the exam. And therefore, as you all are students, mostly I would like you to understand what are the expectations that people will have from you when you, uh, so this is not to, to create any sort of pressure on you, but if you are going to practice in Supreme Court, why not be equipped to do it, right? You can still survive, but this is, this is what I would like you to know that uh, these are the various aspects that you may look at even when you're a student, right? So for example, thorough knowledge of practice and procedure followed in the Supreme Court. So you will uh, find online that there is a book, handbook on, on, I'll just come to that, let me finish this. So handbook on practicing procedure, right? What is that? What is, uh, it's just talking about how it's filed, how it's, where does it go, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so just having a hang of things as to what are the different jurisdictions you, you already have, would have done constitution or will be doing it. You already know the jurisdictions. You already know what when appeal can be filed before the Supreme Court. Those are the basic ones that you need to remember. When is SLP filed? Those are the very basic ones. But when you start doing your internships, then you start understanding the difference. Okay, fine. I could have filed an SLP. I could have filed an SLP in, in all these matters. But why would I file an appeal then? Right? If an appeal is maintainable, I'll file an appeal because I have a right to file an appeal. Then I won't file an SLP because that's a discretionary part. But this is the thing, even uh, lawyers who have been, I was, I was hiring the other day, and I was asking this one question from people who have already drafted SLPs. I was asking them, why do you draft? Why do you file an SLP in a certain case and not an appeal? And they didn't have an answer. So just remember to keep your basics very, very clear when you are stepping into the Supreme Court as to what is the practice, what is the procedure, all of this. So, of course, Constitution gives you a basic knowledge of the jurisdiction, but beyond that, you can look at the handbook and understand why certain matters go to the registrar, certain matters go to the main court, right? So handbook is a bit, bit simple, but if you are more used to reading from bare acts, 
then Supreme Court rules 2013, that's a bear act. That's the bear act based on which the handbook is prepared. So you can go through the Supreme Court rules. You'll understand why certain matters go before the registrar first and then comes to the court, et cetera, et cetera, right? Um, then comes, uh, but you will find it more interesting if you do it during your internships or before your internships, right? Then you understand, okay, fine, today I went to GR1 court. Oh, these were the matters he was handling. Why was he handling these matters? And you don't forget. When you do it, when you also observe the proceedings, then you never forget which matters go before which court, right? Um, then comes your comparative knowledge of the applicability of various jurisdictions. I gave you the example why SLP, uh, SLP can be filed in, in, in every case, but why should it not be filed in every case? If you have a right to appeal, then you definitely file an appeal, right? Um, then comes your sound knowledge of what works, what does not. I, I think if you have a keen eye and you observe the proceedings during, during your internships as well, itself, then you start developing that knowledge right away, right? Um, then, uh, of course, uh, when clients come to you, you need to advise them, would, uh, would it uh, make any sense to move the Supreme Court, et cetera? So you need to allow them to understand uh, the cost and benefit of coming to the Supreme Court, right? And then uh, sometimes the clients may have decided they want to, still they want an honest opinion, right? And therefore, to have that kind of knowledge, if you can showcase that kind of knowledge, then that helps. This I'm saying what they expect from lawyers when they are practicing in the Supreme Court, you will start developing this these now itself, right? And then of course, professional conduct etiquettes and soft skills peculiar to the Supreme Court. So you'll see the style of arguments as they argue before trial court is very different as before the Supreme Court. Um, how it's, it works before the Supreme Court may not work before a trial court judge, or your client may not be very happy if you're arguing before a trial court judge in such a manner. But when it comes to Supreme Court, it's way more sophisticated, et cetera. Right? So you, need to, um, you need to be able to, to appreciate the difference as well, and then kind of develop your own style, how you would want to argue in future. You can imagine yourself arguing, et cetera, et cetera. These are the various... Um, uh, amazing things you can do during internship days as well. What skills can you develop when you're still a student and want to become an EOR? One is, of course, research. And when you're researching, so the thing that happens with interns when they come for internships is that when you ask them to uh, make a note, now this is the, when you, uh, a very, very basic kind of task you would want them to do that, okay, if I research on, perhaps if someone tells you, you research on motive. So then perhaps it's important for you to ask, what do you want for that? And the person says, okay, fine. So uh, then uh, they explain you something. And then you, when they explain you, you try to understand, okay, uh, who am I for in this case? What is the legal proposition that will help me in this case, right? You have to think like a lawyer. You don't have to just prepare a clerical note for them, uh, not a kind of academic uh, paper that you need to write on it. You don't have to. So the very uh, by default, what you end up doing, you just Google uh, motive and whatever comes up in criminal case, whatever comes up, you just put it all together and you give it right those articles and stuff. Uh, but that's not uh, uh, legal research when it comes to litigation would entail, right? So what you would rather do is you would understand the legal proposition that you need to. Um, the conclusion that uh, uh, you would need to draw out of your research, right? So what is it that will help you is what you need to understand from the lawyer by asking him questions. Don't, don't, don't uh, hesitate from asking questions, but what is, it, what is exactly the proposition that I need to look at, look at? Because in motive, you may find motive is relevant. You may find those cases. You may find cases motive is irrelevant in certain circumstances. So you need to understand what are the facts and circumstances in my case, and what is it that will benefit? So if uh, the answer is, okay, motive in this case, we are for the accused and no motive is, has been proved by the prosecution. So I want to argue this point that motive is relevant. Uh, it may not be as relevant to solve the accused altogether, uh, just absence of motive may not do that, but it's still uh, an important consideration. It's something of this sort I'm looking for, right? And then you find the exact case where 
this is what has been said, right? And then you don't find those cases where it has been said that motive, okay, fine, is relevant, but it may be, et cetera, et cetera, right? So uh, you also need to see if it's a case of, for example, circumstantial evidence, not circumstantial evidence. When you start researching, you realize, okay, but I now need to also know this, whether it's a case of circumstantial evidence. So this is how you, uh, when you're asked to research, this is how you do your research that will be effective, that will be useful, right? So if you develop this kind of research skills right from the beginning, that you, then you will be quick and then you will be able to do an exhaustive research. Because when you're arguing before the Supreme Court, it's mostly questions of law that you're focusing on, something that the High Court overlooked, something that the High Court should have considered, right, when they dismiss the case. And therefore, you need to uh, be very thorough with your research. And uh, sometimes uh, when uh, you suggest a certain proposition to the in turn, they would say, but it's not possible to find a case on this, right? Because these are very peculiar facts. It, I wouldn't find a case. So then I already know that they will spend hours and come back with nothing. So to have an open mind when you're researching is also important. And if you can give a bang on case, trust me, that was my strength. Wherever I went, I would give them bang on case. And whatever you are seeking in life will be yours if you can do just that or during your internships or even later, right? Um, then comes your reading judgments, right? Now, this is very important. Why is it important? Because even when you're researching, uh, you are reading judgments and you're trying to understand what it says. Uh, if you find a suitable judgment, sometimes you may not even know it's a suitable judgment. Sometimes you may not realize that, you know, how to find it, you may spend hours on it, right? One is, of course, you learn a lot by trial and error. Um, the other thing that you also need to look at is giving the same example of motive. Now, the case you're looking at, did that help the accused? So what the outcome was in that case, what was the context, what was the outcome, all of that, keeping it together, you need to see how useful that case is. And if you find nothing else, then that's the best case you have. Otherwise, you find, try to find a better case. This is how you work and uh, you, uh, okay, so when you're reading judgments, you try to understand uh, what would constitute material facts and grounds for a petition or appeal before the Supreme Court. So the thing is, when you're reading judgments, you're, you, what are you looking at? So you're, you're often asked by your professors to read judgments. Now you don't know what to, what is it that, why do you need to read judgments, right? It of course develops your ability to analyze, et cetera. But only when you're reading it, not just to find out what the law is, not just to find out what does the case say on Article 14, for example, but just to, to have that kind of a, to understand everything that's happening in that judgment, right? So what are the different things that are happening in judgment? One is that you have the, the court itself states the material facts in, in, in the initial paragraph. So you're not just looking at the findings, you're also looking at how it's done. So when you are looking at the material facts, then you also understand that, fine, so this is how I can write my brief facts when I draft a petition, right? This is how you're also being able to appreciate how legal language is being used, how the judge is giving that version of the facts that, and you'll understand, the moment you read it, you'll understand where it's going, right? Though it's neutral, but it's stated in a certain way. So all of that you get from a judgment itself. How to state facts is also something you're getting from a judgment. And then what did the, the for example, the prosecution submit, what did the defense submit, or the counsel for the petitioner, right? All of those submissions would be there, right? From that, you, you understand, okay, how are they pleaded, right? If the judgments are, are reported form, so you don't get exactly the style of arguments, but it's, it's a great way to learn drafting as well. When you read a lot of judgments, you get a hang of legal language, you get a hang of what sort of grounds will work when you need to draft a petition on similar facts or even different facts, but on the same law, right? So therefore, uh, what different sides submitted, 
what worked, what did not work, then when you read the findings, you would realize, right? So, so then you can also do this exercise when you're reading the facts, you yourself think, what would I have argued, right? And then you read, was there anything extra that they argued? Of course, they relied on several cases. Then the other side also relied on several cases. It means there can be cases on both sides, right? That's an eye opener. There can be cases on both sides. I can find those cases. Right. Whenever a situation comes and I'm not able to find find case that will support me, once it so happened that I found a case that is completely against us, there was no way we could turn, turn it the other way around. And I I thought it's a dead end. But and that's how lawyers work. It's not like it's out there. You need to look for it. Right. So that conviction that you will be able to find a case that will help. You, is, is the basis on which, and then you start building your arguments and then try to, as I told you, you have those legal propositions in mind that will help you. You build those first, it may be vague, and then you look for cases that will support that legal proposition and bit by bit, you build those blocks, right? So therefore, uh, reading these cases, if you're if you're reading it with an open mind, you're you are being curious as to how did it happen, how did this case get decided in this manner. Then reading the arguments are also very important. I remember uh, when I was, uh, you know, I used to read all constitutional law cases when I was in Africa, India. I used to feel like, what did they argue? That uh, you know, how did Minka Gandhi happen? Did they argue something different from Minka Gandhi? Right, so it's not like the judges gave the decision out of the blue. It had been something great about the arguments itself. So, with that premise in mind, I would start reading the cases, and trust me, it has only helped me in my practice. And therefore, to to read the arguments and then read the findings and see why certain cases were relied upon by the court and certain cases were not, how the cases were being distinguished by the judge. Those are the basis of your arguments later on in life. They open up your mind and then you realize, oh, fine, now I know how to distinguish the facts. So reading the judgments, I think that's why it's important. But when you are reading it, you need to be able to appreciate all of these factors. Otherwise, it's of no use. If you don't appreciate how the judges distinguish between facts, would I have been able to do it if I had it? Okay, then in next case, how does it happen? Why is it this different from that? Right? Then you, you analyze in this manner. Then you learn the basic crafts, which you, you may not appreciate at that time, but when you have to apply it, you yourself will be able to do it. Right? And therefore, you should continue to, to brush up your skills in this manner. Right? OK. The next one is, of course, I told you about the language, precise and accurate, crisp. So one thing that I often suggest to people is when you're drafting, just read a few judgments on the same law, same similar facts, etc. Then you get a hang of language. Keep reading, 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 and then you get a hang of language, and then you start drafting it. So even as in tones, if you take up any drafting, read a few judgments, and then do it. Uh, you can even go back to those judgments, copy a few phrases from there that you would like to use because those are very, very accurate description of the facts or the grounds then you can use those phrases as well, right? Um, develop understanding of a scope of fundamental rights. I told you reading those judgments help you, help you to understand the contextual interpretation, why in certain situations this case was used, why in certain situations that case was used, how did the different sides interpret the same judgment differently, right? All of this. So next time you read a judgment, you don't read it just to understand what, what what it means, right? What it why what was held in that judgment that you can get anywhere that you can get from the commentary itself, but you read it to understand how was it argued and how and it will open up your mind uh, in future, right? So um, and the other skill you develop while reading judgments is skimming and scanning because you have to go through a lot of judgments. Um, that's the advantage of having SEC online, et cetera, these days, then you can go through a lot of judgments and find the appropriate judgment for you. So you need to be able to skim and scan to that quickly, right? And that comes when you read a lot, right? Then you know which part to skip and where is, is the one that you're looking for. The, the finding that you want exactly, you will 
come to that. Um, learn to examine the usefulness of a judgment when they're wholly or in parts. Now, one thing that people sometimes do it, they quote something that's not very relevant for us in that case. So for example, in motive, there may be a, a 1000 lines of motive written in the judgment. Uh, yeah, motives are important, motives can. Now that is neither here nor there. So if you find me a, a relevant paragraph that is relevant for this case, that will be relevant for me. You can find me any any flowery language or motive that can go in academic writing. That doesn't come in a draft, right? Um, then you have, uh, when you're reading the judgment initially, you would also be quite, you may be curious to understand what can, what are the different stages of litigation? Okay, fine. These were the facts, and this came from the, this came as an appeal from the consumer forum, right? It is from NCDRC. Why? In these facts, could I have done something else? But I thought in these facts, this is what the appropriate remedy would be. Why is it not so? Let me look at what the law says, right? So this can also be done while you're reading the judgments to understand the different jurisdiction and how it works, why someone chose a certain forum and not the other one. Um, then comes, of course, I told you how you call out the subtle law relating to an issue. So it all depends on the issue you're researching on the legal proposition you want to come to, et cetera. Um, and then you have uh, which part to use, I told you. Main, on many occasions, uh, students kind of go to paragraph that, that, that's quite impressively written by the judge, but it's of no use when it comes to quoting it, right? Um, okay, understand the facts and circumstances under which cases de get decided in favor, right? So contextual interpretation, again, to, to be able to appreciate it, it will open your mind and you will the moment you read two judgments, one is in your favor, one is against you, you will be able to draw a distinction between them. Uh, and you won't even know how did you develop that skill that happened when you were reading those judgments, right? Um, then comes your, so in Supreme Court litigation, a chunk of it is an appeal or an SLP where you're coming from an order of a high court, so challenging the judgment of high court. And therefore, how you read the order which is being challenged is called impugned order. Right? The order you're impugning in that case, uh, that becomes crucial, right? And therefore, when you're reading the judgments, generally that's helping you. Even when you, you are analyzing the impugned order, it will help you to, to learn the skill of analyzing, right? So then you're first looking at, okay, which is, where are the facts? In, so you now know that in the initial paragraphs, you'll find the facts, then in criminal matters, you'll find the evidence, and then you'll find the submissions of both the sides, and then comes the findings. So you already know this structure. Uh, then when you are uh, reading it, you're analyzing it, you are uh, doing it with the objective of finding the grounds of appeal or challenge or SLP, right? You're trying to, to, to understand why that order is wrong. How can you say that the judge did something that it should not have done, it did not consider a certain argument, or it should have interpreted the case in this manner, etc. Et so, so read it with that in mind. So even when you're going for internships, when you are given a, a impugned order and if you're ready for that challenge, I hope, I think people do uh, trust you with these kind of assignments as well. They give you the high court order. This is what needs to be challenged. And then when, when you're reading it, you have those glasses on, which will allow you to see those gaps in the judgments, right? And those th that I, to look for gaps will come when you are reading judgments, when you know that this is how the judgments are found to be to be wrong by the Supreme Court. This is how they have decided in other cases. And so you will follow the same kind of path then, and it will be a familiar path for you. 
right? Um, and then distinguishing questions of law, questions of facts, that becomes a matter of practice then. And then that's not something that you remember by heart. Okay, this is question of law, this is question. And you realize, okay, fine. So this is a question, for example, motive, that's a question of law, right? Question of fact would be whether, whether this had happened, not happened, et cetera. So then Supreme Court, of course, would be focusing on question of law and therefore you should be able to distinguish that as well. Um, so when, um, so there, there are uh, chambers where you may not get to draft, but again, if you, if you are clear about how to research, et cetera, I remember uh, asking um, an intern to research, she did it so well. Of course, initially she had a note prepared, the same kind of note I was telling you about, kind of uh, article kind of a note. And then I had to, uh, to tell her, and maybe I, it was my fault that I didn't tell her exactly what, what I would like her to focus on. And then we divided it in, in, into propositions. And then under each proposition, I asked her, put a case law, right? So I broke it for her. Sometimes lawyers wouldn't do that, and therefore you may have to ask them to do that for you. And then you start, because initial days, you would need some, some help in breaking them into propositions. And then you can do your research. Once you've done your research, instantly I could ask her to draft it because she'd already done it, right? And then you just have to need to have a draft and then you can also draft it. It's possible to start drafting uh, in, uh, in your college days itself, but the whole point is you need to be, and trust me, the intern had drafted it so well that just with a few edits, we could send it for filing. So that's possible. Uh, but uh, before you start drafting, it's also important for you to read a few drafts, right? So that's why you, of course, with virtual internships, it's quite, uh, there, there are many limitations that you face, but still you can ask them to send soft copies of, of uh, a few drafts. Don't just have one format and start drafting. Read a few drafts uh, before you start drafting, right? And even after that, continue to read whenever you get a chance you should not shy away from reading the uh, already drafted petitions. Again, with an eye to observe how the facts are stated, how ingredients become evident when you read the facts, how, uh, what would constitute material facts? How do you, if you're given just nothing, how do you come up with what, what are material facts? Of course, in Supreme Court drafting, it's not very difficult because high court petition, is already there or the order is already there, there, you get the facts from there, right? But then what, uh, then what is the difference between the high court order and your, your present petition? High court petition and your present petition, right? What was argued before the high court? How is it different from the grounds that they have prepared now? Compare those and see, right? That's how you learn. The more you, you are able to sift things, distinguish things, analyze it, the more you learn and keep thinking how you would have done it. And then when you read it, then you realize, oh, this is done in a different way. Maybe this is more useful, right? Uh, appreciating the possibility of experimenting with ideas, language, those are very, very useful, right? So look at the, keep focusing on the language if you find good drafts. The, the distinction between good drafts and not so good drafts would be how they don't lose persuasiveness, even when they're using brief and concise language, right? So you will see that's the difference between uh, Supreme Court drafting and other courts drafting There's a massive difference. And that's the difference. It can be brief and concise and yet be very, very persuasive. So you can develop that as well. And again, it comes from judgments to a great extent because judgments are like drafted like that, right? Um, learn to use precise and curate words, right? So this again, you need to keep developing it by reading a lot of drafts, judgments, etc., right? Um, and then actually doing it yourself. Then you can see how well are you able to do. And then you get better at it. Each time you do, you get better. Just can't keep reading and think, now I'll be able to do it. You have to also start doing it, right? Um, then you can also uh, observe when you do physical internships, you can observe how lawyers prepare for hearings, right? One becomes devil's advocate, just observe it from a very, very good person's point of view, what is happening actually here, right? Um, 
is the way. So sometimes uh, interns are too excited and they want to get involved in it. But I would also suggest sometimes it's also great to just observe. And then if, if the time comes when you observe it very, very keenly, then the time comes where you can also contribute, you will be able to do that, instead, right? Um, okay, so when you are observing, you, you, are, you are looking for uh, how they're preparing. If you're briefing a senior council, then how they're preparing notes for a senior advocate. This is something that happens a lot in Supreme Court and therefore it becomes an important limb. Some advocates just uh, act as those middlemen who just go and brief senior counselors and do, they do it really, really well. Um, so you can develop that skill as well while you are uh, you know, doing an internship. You can keep observing how they're preparing those notes and how they are briefing. You can also ask them to take you for a briefing. Right, or even if it's virtual, you can ask them if you can also uh, be there. You know, uh, then comes then observe how matters are discussed and notes are prepared for arguing cases. So I enjoy when I was interning. I used to enjoy looking at even the next uh, person's notes. So uh, Mr. Jen Bhushan, he he never had. Uh, his notes were never visible because it was always a Sudoku page. So he would open the file and he'll have the Times of India folded Sudoku page and he would do Sudoku, right? So from my distance, you'll think, oh, he's looking at his notes. You'll go closer and you'll realize no, it's actually Sudoku. So um, otherwise, generally lawyers have it on their first page, small little scribblings, and you can just look at them and see, okay, this is how they make notes, okay, this is how they make and then you develop your own style, right? Uh, we have realized lawyers don't write every line and every bit of what they're going to argue, but these are just points and they are always numbered or there are arrow marks, etc., uh, just denoting the order in which they're going to argue it, right? Uh, and then during hearings, what do you do? You observe, so you're just not sitting there, just looking at who's smiling, who's not smiling, etc. You are going beyond that and you are observing how. So if you have heard the discussion and then you're attending the hearing, you get to see how lawyers may change their strategy by that, right? When judge is not looking convinced, he's just jumping to end the point and he's starting to argue that and then he's coming back to it. Right, when to stop, when to come back at a later stage, all that to start observing and learning. Um, so observation plays a key role, and I'm very glad that I was uh, I was introduced to this concept by Mr. Krishwit when I was interning under him uh, in first year itself. He said, just observe how judicial mind works. So sitting in court, just do that, right? Um, so while you're doing that, you also understand that lawyers are also understanding what the judge is thinking and they're trying to address it, right? Um, how lawyers use storytelling, theatrics, rhetorics during arguments. You can see that a lot more in Supreme Court than any other court. So you can just observe how they are doing it instead of just using it as an anecdote as well. Just observe it as a skill, right? Um, I think different kinds of court proceedings even before registrar, chamber judge, as I told you before. Right, uh, advocate and record examination, once you've done all of this in your student's life, in your initial years, then examination will sound like nothing to you. Um, not that any of this will come to your rescue, but to an extent it will. Why? Because uh, as you would see, there are four papers that comes for the exam. And most people uh, appear for it when they're practicing and they don't get enough time, etc. cetera. But, uh, and also because they have not written exams for the last five years, that's, I think, one of the main issues people face, uh, they don't have practice of writing and all those stuff. Right now, you won't understand any of it if you're a student, but those are the challenges you will face later on. But Supreme Court rules 2013 is really, really important to understand practice and procedure. And then, as I told you, the different jurisdictions, those questions are asked, right? Some of it you observe and learn, but, but many of it you, many of it you just know when you're practicing. And that helps because you've seen, okay, there's a three judge bench also. What sort of matters are they hearing, right? Okay, this matter has been referred to a larger bench, now to appear before a larger bench. So you know that matters get referred. Uh, you also know that when they are in doubt, it gets referred. Are there any other situations when matters get referred? So there's not much to 
to you know then understand uh, then and then comes your so therefore you, if you are planning to become a newer just keep some sort of supreme court practice alive during those five years right don't completely shut yourself out thinking now let me practice in trial court and high court or high court coupled with other forums and then i'll appear for advocate in a court and then i'll start practicing that may be a bad idea because many of the lawyers who appear for the exam and i have been training them they have this psychological disadvantage to feel i don't know nothing i know nothing about it so therefore just just uh, you know having some sort of acquaintance with the proceedings helps right even to study it helps then your drafting paper is again the same kind of i told you already what sort of skills you need to develop but for your examination of course you just need to be very clear of the format and then they also look for grounds etc and you have to write it down in the exam hall right i wish by the time you you sit they have a, a computer that you can use and you can copy paste as well i wish that happens because that's how we normally do but during exam we have to write all of it um advocacy and professional ethics there's a paper on that and and you those are like essays that you prepare at that time and you, people generally prepare only for a month they think they'll prepare for a year they end up preparing only for a month but sometimes it may be advisable to study a bit but but not uh, like before a year it may, doesn't make sense because these are essays that won't be of any use later but you just need to kind of know them right um then comes your leading cases once you have developed this practice of reading judgment scanning through skimming through judgments and this will be nothing because you get head notes from supreme court report and therefore you can always you know sometimes you may not want to do it in the examination hall you may want to get acquainted with the head notes beforehand and then it will be easier for you in the examination hall to so get the head notes for leading cases but most of the questions would be analytical and stuff some of it would be of course to be a paraphrase and write from the head notes right and therefore all that i told you the skills that i asked you to develop from now onwards are going to help you to become an a1 not just clear the exam will also help you in clearing the exam right so these uh, there's no like set syllabus for it these this is the only notification that you get that in professional ethics these are the things you need to also keep in mind and go through so what generally helps is looking at the uh, the past question paper so if you are acquainted with the supreme court website so you can find your examination tab here you can find the lectures right uh, that's conducted by the examiners themselves those who they said the question paper and then they also kind of examine your your answer scripts all those lectures you'll find here but i don't think there's any urgency to to listen to them if you uh, have to appear after say 3 4 years right um these are the old question papers again you need to have a look only before you are appearing um right that's it i think we have covered i i would love to take questions from you but do kind of uh, look at supreme court's websites where you'll find a lot of information for example judges roster so you will know which bench handles which so what sort of cases so if you want to hear this case for example if you want to hear company matters which and i i'll kind of advise you to go to different benches and hear different matters during your internship days it's amazing to do that right so these this is the roster that they have then i told you about the handbook as well so you can find the handbook as well in the supreme court's website yes so i guess i can take questions now right um so thank you ma'am for your indispensable and discerning insights on uh various topics like requirements of becoming an aor various fields of law that one may practice in before taking the aor exam the various limbs of litigation uh, uh in the supreme court 
why to become an AOR uh, aspects other than clearing the exam and the skills that students can develop to become an AOR. Um, now we do have some questions from our viewers. Uh, so uh, one of the questions is that, uh, what kind of challenges can students expect in their journey to become an AOR? And what kind of challenges did you personally face uh, on your journey to becoming an AOR? Right. So it's more to do with, it's it's not about, uh, people generally make it only about clearing the exam, right? And I know people who didn't clear the exam for five years. So for them, the challenge must have been to clear the exam. For them, nothing else mattered, but only clearing the exam did. But with me, I, I didn't think that clearing the exam was such a big challenge. Um, I told you the only challenge was I had not written for a very long time. I also have dystonia. I, I didn't know where to apply for a scribe. So I decided to write that myself all those challenges I did have. But um, the thing is, uh, as I said, that it's not just clearing the exam, but the challenge for any young lawyer would be the fact that you're young and you are seen as young, right? And therefore uh, you are, It's an. It's, sometimes it's an advantage also with the kind of judges we have now, they kind of can be considerate towards you. Sometimes you find it to be patronizing as well, but Sometimes it helps for you to, and you see so many other young lawyers as well around these days. It was very different earlier, right? So, uh, so then, but the thing is, you somehow need to get the chance to argue as well. That's also something you don't get when you're young. And suddenly, when you are an AOR, or uh, even after you become an AOR, you you may not, uh, you know, your client may want to brief someone else. They may want to brief a senior. Again, your chances of arguing may be limited and therefore it's important for you to grab every opportunity because once you are, you know, in that bracket where you are no longer seen as a young counsel, then people are expecting you to argue really well. And if you have had no exposure of arguing before, then again, you will be very shy and you wouldn't want to argue by yourself. You would want to brief someone else. So that's the challenge I think by and Right. Um, thank you for thank you for your answer, ma'am. Uh, one more question we have. Uh, the, some of our students want to know uh, if you could give us give them certain preparation tips for the AOR exam. Uh, in, in terms of what what kind of books they can refer to, what kind right. of material. Uh, yeah. Right. So I didn't realize we have uh, people in the audience who would want that as well. So again, that's like a one hour lecture and the le one hour lecture. But uh, I would like to tell you that when you're preparing, just the other day I was advising someone because there are people who want to appear just this year and they still are not sure when the exams will happen, etc. this year. So therefore, what I would suggest to you, just have a one month plan if you're thinking of, of appearing this year because otherwise it, your preparation gets delayed and delayed. Um, therefore, one month plan would be one week for every paper, having a fixed timeline for, for them, starting with practice and procedure. The books that you can refer, of course, constitutional law books to uh, um, prepare notes on jurisdiction. And then you have Supreme Court Rules Bear Act. Then you have the handbook. That should suffice as far as uh, practice and procedure is concerned, but you also need to look at past case, uh, past question papers, because there will be some questions here and there that is more to do with practice, for example, benches and all, then you need to prepare your own answers and keep, do listen to uh, back uh, uh, the previous year's lectures that will also help you to understand which all cases you need to focus on, right? Um, the other thing, because there's no set syllabus and that's one of the challenges that comes that it's not given, but when you attend the lecture, you get that structure. And then you know what all topics you need to prepare on, right? That's important. Um, then the second uh, paper would be, so for example, when you're preparing for drafting, then you need to write and do it. I told you the challenge that people face, they think they have already been drafting and say, so they don't pay much attention to it. But if you, what I used to do is I used to count the line as well because we're so used to, you know, copying and pasting that if you miss one line there, for example, what if I miss civil appellate jurisdiction? So if I would count the lines uh, in the course title itself so that at least I get the formatting right. And then for grounds, I told you, you can keep reading a few, you can look at the past question papers. There will always be questions on special laws, 
uh, NDPS, etc. So you can prepare a few past question papers that will give you confidence. Don't miss out any question on criminal law. If you look at the question paper, which questions you attempt, that also makes a difference. Uh, if you are looking at a very, very technical question and you don't know many of the grounds, that will be a problem. Criminal law, mostly in the facts itself, you'll get grounds. So do attempt the criminal law questions. That's crucial. Uh, third is your professional ethics paper. Uh, as you would see in the syllabus, you would see the, the, you, they have bar council rules. In bar council rules, you need to look at the standards, uh, the kind of uh, duty towards the client, duty towards judges, duties towards other lawyers, those you need to be conversant with. There can be questions on non-solicitation, et cetera, then you can write on that based on what you've read. Um, and there will be a question on, for example, professional misconduct or something related to that. So Samara Dikte Policy Advocates Act, those few pages you can either get photocopied. I think professional misconduct is covered really well in that. Uh, look for material of uh, uh, Mr. Venkat Ramani online in the SC website itself on, prof on uh, uh, professional ethics. There are books available on, on professional ethics. Just find the book that, that really speaks to you uh, because these are more like essays. And I had, of course, I told you I have an academic bent of mine. So I actually uh, downloaded research papers and I read from that, I prepared my own notes from there. So whatever works for you, uh, you can also go online and prepare your own answers on those topics, the topics you get from the past question papers. Uh, one will definitely be on adversarial system. Then you get questions on on freedom of press, like freedom of speech and expression, vis-a-vis -vis contempt, et cetera. Um, I think Samara Dittapal kinds of con uh, somewhere covers that as well. Uh, contempt of court, again, bear acts, you need to have contempt of court act. Uh, uh, I think it's also Samara Dittapal. Mm, that book is also quite, it's a commentary that's also uh, useful. Um, so this is it. I think by and large, I've covered leading cases. Again, it, you have to go through back question papers and you need to understand what sort of questions are being asked. And then you need to, whatever the list of leading cases is, you need to do the, the you know, previous cases. For example, if it's Minka Gandhi, you are doing Karak Singh as well, even though it's overruled. And then you're doing the later cases, put the sorry, all of this as well. You know the entire uh, this thing because that's not there in the case note. Whatever is there in the case note, you, you can prepare a kind of topical index of those cases. For example, each case, what it covers, and for each topic, which are the cases you need to refer to. Sometimes there may be questions on just that topic. They are not referring to any case in the question itself. So you don't want to miss out any case by writing down. That's it. Thanks. Right. Uh, thank you so much, ma'am, for this wonderful answer. Uh, this great, great, great. Sorry, the screen just. Can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. I think uh, Madhav has some issues on this. Right, no problem. But if I can uh, just take on one of the questions that uh, was posted, can you share probably um, a memorable case that you argued before the Supreme Court as an AOR? Um, just a little sort of, uh, you know, memory lane back for you as well. So we'd like right. to hear from you. Right. Oh, 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 I think it was before uh, justice as an EOR. So I'll, I'll refer to two cases, actually. One is uh, before Justice Chandrachur, where I was not even an EOR in that particular case. Right. Uh, now, it was being argued, it was a case on disability rights. And uh, my... My case was also relating to disability rights, but that was listed after a couple of matters. So when my matter was called out, after I argued my matter, I said, you know, in the other matter, item number so and so, I may have some inputs. And uh, just the chances to kind of allowed me to argue uh, because they were going to hear it on a later date. So, uh, so that the judgment kind of records appreciation for me, et cetera, though. Uh, at that time. So the writ petition was confined to just one student who, who wanted a scribe, right? And I was, I saw it as a, as a potential case that will kind of define the scope of reasonable accommodation for years to come. So that's how Vikash versus uh, UPSC got decided because I was like, well, I see the entire scope being defined. And when you look at it, you, you see general comments, et cetera. So those were the documents that 
I referred during the proceedings and that was then relied upon in the judgment. And trust me, when the hearing was going on, the judges were not with me. And when the judgment came, the judgment said exactly what it was trying to explain. So that can also happen. When you don't give up, you keep pushing your point. You keep trying to explain it in different ways. You keep giving different analogies to explain your point. And uh, I was very frustrated, to be very honest. I was very frustrated when the judges wouldn't understand. I think they also got. And uh, on hindsight, maybe that's what I would like to change, that you don't want the judge to understand you're also frustrated. Uh, but when you keep trying, keep pushing, keep trying to persuade them in different ways, then, uh, then that's one example where I really succeeded in making a difference there. Thank you so much for that. It was, it was really nice listening to that. Over to you, Mary. Um, so we have, we have just one more question uh, from one of our viewers. Um, so the, the question is that, what is the rationale behind the AOR exam? Uh, is huh. this sort of an exercise uh, right. to filter out? Um, and, right. and what is generally the rationale? I'm very glad you asked this question because I was supposed to cover it. I was supposed to tell you why you need to wait for these many years and then sit for an exam. Because what happens is Supreme Court tries to maintain a certain standard. Uh, so when you even go to attend the proceedings, you'll realize nobody is, is lost there. Things are happening very fast and very effective in a very effective manner. People are just coming, arguing, going. Everyone knows what's to be done. How does that happen? Because they make one person kind of accountable for it. And that's the AOR. You are accountable. If something goes wrong in your matter, we look for you. So therefore, he ensures whether or not you can see him in the courtroom, he ensures somebody is there from his office, senior is, is you know, they're coordinating with the senior, all of that he ensures. And therefore, you see such smooth proceedings happening, right? And therefore, when you read even, even the contempt of court uh, cases, and therefore professional ethics paper has that, so you need to read that. And when you're reading contempt of court cases under that, that head, you are not just reading any contempt of court cases. You're reading those that have been uh, initiated against advocates and against advocate on recall because something went wrong in the matter and they were not there, et cetera, et cetera, right? So it's... Uh, so, so all of this, you need to know before you become an advocate on the court that what you don't need to do, what can be the malpractices, what can be a misconduct, is it any different from an AOR? Are there any higher standards for the AOR? All of that you need to have knowledge of before you step into the shoe of, of an AOR. And even for drafting, so you see all the drafts uh, being, of course, it goes to the registry, even there, the section offices are very, very particular about defects and stuff. Everything is, is very well organized, right? Margins and everything is in place. How does that happen? Because again, you, once you have cleared the exam, if you have already prepared all of that, you know exactly how it's to be done. And therefore you, you have managed to clear this, is the understanding that we have. Um, practice and procedure, same thing. You need to know it and therefore you can run around. You know why it is before the GR. You don't go there and, and you are not sounding clueless. I don't know why it's distributed, right? That never happens because we already know the practice. Procedure. That's why you have an exam and it's after a, a number of years just to ensure, of course, that's not uh, being strictly followed now because anybody can argue, but then it's just to ensure that it's, filed by a person who has sufficient years of experience so that they can do a kind of job that's not very frustrating for even the judges to read a draft and say, what has, have you written? Because you have a certain years of experience. Over there. Right. Um, thank you so much, ma'am, for this great discussion. Um, I'm sure that your invaluable guidance will inspire our students. Uh, and with this, I think we are, uh, we are now out of questions and uh, we, we finally come to the end of our first lecture on the uh, litigation lecture series. Uh, so thank you so much, ma'am, for taking our time uh, today uh, to come and have this discussion with us. Um, and I'm, I'm, I'm sure that our students will, uh, will really appreciate this talk. 
thank you so much thank you so much for having me thanks uh so dear students we look forward to your active participation in the next lecture of the litigation series which is scheduled today at 4 pm uh it will be it will be delivered by advocate nipun saxena on the art of trial advocacy and uh, we will shortly circulate the joining link for the same uh thank you all and have a wonderful weekend and uh see you in the next lecture Sajidji, you can uh, turn off the live and stop the recording. Hello. Please stop the live session. Yes, you can stop the recording and you can turn off the live.